Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Exchange, the pubcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Clay Zimmerman, one of your hosts at the Real Science Exchange. And tonight we're coming from the New Developments in Transition Cow Nutrition Seminar here in Stoke-on-Trent, England. I'd like to welcome our two guests this evening. Uh, first of all, Dr. Jose Santos from the University of Florida. Uh, he, he gave a presentation today on choline, a required nutrient. And Dr. Chris Reynolds from the University of Reading talking about fresh ideas for fresh cows. I am not the normal host for the Real Science Exchange. That would be Scott Sorrell, but Scott was not able to join us. But I've been told I have a face made for radio, but not a voice. <laughs> um, so let's start off. So Jose, can you give us just a really brief summary of what you discussed today? Well, uh, so basically I discussed some of the latest research that's been done uh, with choline supplementation for transition cows using room protect choline products. And just uh, to make a long story short, there is uh, <clears throat> substantial evidence that choline plays an important role in transition cow nutrition in particular because of the positive effects on uh, yields of energy-corrected milk, consistent responses that extend beyond the period of uh, supplementation. Uh, its uh, uh, role on uh, hepatic uh, fatty acid metabolism, but also some insights on potential benefits to cow health. And Chris, could you give us a summary of what you discussed today? Yes, thank you, Clay. Um, my presentation focused on protein nutrition, of very early lactation cows. Um, we talked about the fact that cows are in a quite substantial ne uh, negative balance for metabolizable protein in the first week or two postpartum. Uh, we talked about the potential role of glucose synthesis by the liver of the cow uh, in terms of uh, contributing to that protein deficiency through the catabolism of amino acids for gluconeogenesis, and I showed some data to suggest that that was an obligatory requirement and glucose synthesis doesn't really contribute to the deficit of essential amino acids, certainly in early lactation. And then I showed some data from uh, one of our colleagues in, in Denmark, Moens Larsen, who's done some really interesting work uh, using abomasal infusion of casein and, and the, or the amino acids in casein uh, provided to cows immediately after calving, within hours of calving, sh and showing that that produced a quite substantial increase in milk yield of those cows. And then we talked about other studies that we've done using rumen drenches as a way of trying to supplement cows immediately after calving. Uh, some of the problems we've had with palatability of the supplements we used, and, and just talked about where we might uh, go from there in terms of finding supplements that would provide uh, essential amino acids and total protein to cows very early on after, after calving. And it's a challenging uh, problem. Yes, great. And <clears throat> I gave a presentation on not all ruminant end caps are created equal. And um, I discussed um, differences in products um, due to nutrient payload in the product, certainly differences in, um, in coating composition and amounts, uh, manufacturing technologies, um, and really uh, the main point is, you know, there really, are, there really are four parts of a good ruminant end cap. The first one being good ruminal stability. The second being uh, good intestinal um, digestibility. The third part, which is often overlooked, is good feed mixing and TMR stability of an end cap, and then ultimately proving biological response in the cow. So we do have a live audience with us today, so we'd like to start taking questions from the audience for the panel.
New research is changing everything we thought we knew about choline's impact on the cow and her calf, and top scientists have a lot to say about it. They are presenting new research that supports choline as a required nutrient to optimize milk production, choline as a required nutrient to support a healthy transition, choline as a required nutrient to improve calf health and growth, and choline as a required nutrient to increase colostrum quantity. This new research is solidifying choline's role as a required nutrient for essentially every cow, regardless of health status, milk production level, or body condition score. Learn more about the science that is changing the game and the choline source that is making it happen. Reassure Precision Release Choline from Balchem. Visit balchem.com slash scientists say to learn more. Don't be shy. My name is Joe Magadi from UFAC UK. I've got a question for Dr. Santos. Um, this is regard to the level of uh, choline ion that we need to be feeding to the transition cow. Apparently, as of now, we don't have an agreed level that we feel is considered as optimum. Can you comment on that? And also, given the the close relationship between methionine and choline. Is there some kind of, say, like when we talk of uh, lysine and methionine, talk of, say, one to three in that kind of ratio? Could there also be a kind of ratio between, say, methionine and, uh, and, and choline? Thank you. Well, all I can comment relative to dose of choline ion that's fed as choline chloride that's encapsulated is that all the data that I'm aware of has fed up to about 25 grams of choline ion. That would be equivalent to perhaps, that's during the transition period. There has been, there have been experiments in which cows were supplemented with larger quantities past the transition period. So work in the 90s by Richard Mann He's done infusion experiments as well as feeding room protected choline at the time with the, the technology at the time, in which, if I recall correctly, they fed as many as 40 grams uh, to cows of uh, choline ion, uh, uh, either through a bomazo infusion or uh, feeding as room protected products. So, in the transition period, unfortunately, our data is restricted to this smaller amount. And at least based on the meta-analysis, which we try to pull together data from multiple experiments, we haven't been able to detect a quadratic effect, meaning that there would reach a plateau and no longer uh, find a response. But there is a weakness in the data, and I want you to be aware of. <clears throat> the majority of data is concentrated in this 12 to 15 grams. We don't have a lot of experiments in the very high levels, and mathematically that affects your predictions of responses. Having said that, there has been at least one recent experiment that uh, Dr. Zimmerman <coughs> mentioned, which was the Michigan State, State Experiment, in which they fed the traditional 12.9 grams of choline ion, and then they increased that uh, by 50%, so they probably went to about uh, 19 grams of choline ion, and they didn't see an additional response in that particular experiment. It's N equals to one, so you gotta take that with a grain of salt. So if you ask my intuition, I think early lactation cows would respond to a larger dose. I may be wrong, but that would be my take uh, of that. I think of everything that we heard from Clay today probably will be product dependent because we'll heavily depend on, on how much choline ion you can deliver to the small intestine. So if I do my own experiment with my own product, the response will be completely different, okay? So that would be my interpretation of the data today. Now your second question is a little harder to answer because I think even the lysine methionine three to one ratio is not necessarily correct. But if we want to have thumb rules, uh, I think we would probably be 
more appropriate if we were to measure amino acids relative to energy as opposed to you know an amino acid relative to another amino acid that would that would be my my take i would go more towards what the monogastric people do in which they titrate grams of metabolizable amino acids relative to the energy they feed to animals i think that might be a more appropriate approach and i think there's some effort in the u.s uh, in that aspect so uh, now can i come up with a ratio of choline to methionine, I think we're going to have the same issue of how much choline we actually deliver to the intestine. It's theoretical at this point. So I'll give an example. I'm aware of only one true bioavailability experiment with room protect choline. And what I mean by bioavailability, I feed, it shows up in blood. That's the true concept of bioavailability from the pharmacokinetics point of view. You know, I feed something, it shows up somewhere in blood. So choline is a little complicated because probably when it gets absorbed in that first pass through the intestine and the associated tissues, some of that gets already utilized there. So there's a conversion perhaps into acetylcholine by the neurons that uh, 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 bat the gastrointestinal tract. There may be oxidation to betaine there may be phosphorylation to phosphocholine. So what shows up in the portal drain viscera may be altered because of this initial metabolism. But in that particular experiment, the bioavailability, uh, the relative bioavailability of choline in a room protect form was about almost 14% of infusing choline chloride in the abomasum. About 14%, yes. Okay, and that's a product that shows efficacy. You feed to cows, they respond. Okay, now what, what happens if I feed something different? Or what if that product, they change the formulation, you know? That changes those results. So it's hard for me to tell what should be the ideal ratio of choline ion because it's purely empirical. There's no mechanism because it's hard to measure it. Right. Those things. It's, it's not a simple task. So I don't have a good answer for your second question. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to continue on with your bioavailability. Yeah. Because uh, we, we have we've done a lot of work looking at choline bioavailability. There is no accepted method on 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 how to do this in a in a dairy cow. Um, choline is converted to a lot of different metabolites, um, a dozen or more metabolites. So it's, it's, um, it's very co complex. It's probably also very stage of lactation dependent. You know, how does, how would this um, transition cow metabolize choline compared to a cow during, later in lactation? Probably you're probably going to get a different answer in different metabolites. Yeah. And we, we've done some work looking at that. Um, so I think there will be some newer methods coming along uh, where, where we can take a better look at that. But they're just, uh, that data is just not It's not a simple right task. Now. Right. And, you know, and sometimes information in published literature gets misinterpreted or short-sighted, I should say. I'll give an example. <clears throat> Uh, we've done one experiment that we fed uh, choline past 21 days postpart. We fed it the standard dose of 12.9 grams of choline ion of a particular product, okay? So we didn't see additional benefits. So whether we fed for only the, the, tra the transition period or we extend the feeding past the transition period, we didn't see benefits. So if you look at that, you would conclude we don't need to feed beyond that point. But there are data in literature with large doses of choline that mid-lactation cows produce more milk. So you got to interpret those results with the dose that we fed and the fact that we fed during the transition period in that particular experiment. Maybe there are other things in the diet that precluded them to respond, that there is no response to feeding past 21 days. But I can find in literature work by Rich, uh, by Rich Erdman that shows that 
hey, if I put 40 grams of choline ion, they actually produce more milk, particularly in low protein diets. Uh, they've shown that. So sometimes you gotta be careful how to interpret data to not be short-sighted and think that that's the universal truth, yeah. Next question. Thanks, David Wilde, Massey Harper Feeds. Uh, thanks for the uh, the talks earlier today. This may be a bit of a strange question, uh, looking mainly at Jose and uh, Chris here. Jose, earlier you said that you know 98, 99% of sort of dietary choline will be degraded in the rumen or metabolized in some form or other. Whereas with lysine, methine, we know there's an amount escapes with the bypass protein fraction of the diets. Are we then looking at sort of evolutionary that the ruminant animal has evolved not to require any bypass choline. And so are we sort of trying to do something a bit different? So just discuss on, on that one. Is it, do we actually- That's a great it? point, yeah. So I'll give my take and then I'll let Dr. Reynolds. Uh, so ruminants evolve eating grass. Yeah, we never fed 10 kilos of steam flake corn to ruminants. We do today. Obviously, that changes what they see post-digesting. You know, a dairy cow never had to produce 50 kilos of milk. So the synthetic machinery in terms of synthesizing phospholipids to secrete milk fat, completely different. The amount of nutrients they had to absorb, they never had to eat 1.2 kilograms of long-chain fatty acids. So you guys or your clients buy semen of the best bulls out there you're continuously selecting for greater production. I doubt any of your clients select against yields of milk components, correct? <laughs> so yeah, we change cows. Uh, and to me, the best example is work that was done where Dr. Reynolds used to work uh, through my interactions with people who were members of the uh, nascent committee. When they look at data of uh, uh, not necessarily basal uh, metabolism, but uh, maintenance requirement of cows that were done by uh, the USDA in the 60s and 70s, those cows fit very nicely this concept of 73 to 77 kilocalories per kilogram of metabolic weight for maintenance requirements. When they look at the most recent data that was generated there, those cows that were in the, if I'm not mistaken, the late 90s, early 2000, the latest measurements, they were in the 110 to 120 kilocalories. Okay, very different maintenance requirements for whatever reason, maybe differences in body composition, maybe metabolic rate really changed. So the committee came to a middle ground and put 100 kilocalories per kilogram metabolic weight. So that's a, a good example of change in the individual that now is more demanding because we select for greater production. So when cows were quote unquote beef cattle, the needs to synthesize anything, including phospholipids was a lot less. Uh, the negative nutrient balance, not just energy, but everything was probably less pronounced, particularly if they had feed available. So their ability to consume to meet the needs was uh, probably easier than a high producing dairy cow today. So I think it's not surprising that things have changed and we create an animal that's slightly different than the norm, still very adaptable, and that animal benefits from some things that we may change. But you're right, in the past they completely depend on uh, resynthesizing phosphatidylcholines from that transmethylation pathway but now we've learned that they probably benefit, although we haven't necessarily characterized that, from synthesizing phosphatidylcholine through uh, choline supply. That would be my interpretation of what's going on. Uh, I, I think Jose answered the question very well, David. Uh, um, and it, it is interesting. Um, I, I've done quite a bit of work, Henry Terrell and I, back in, when I was at USDA, working with that, those energy uh, uh, that, that energy metabolism unit in, in the respiration chambers were comparing beef and dairy cows. And a beef cow does, does not, they, well, they are different and they're not in terms of, in terms of the relationship between 
between metabolizable energy intake and net energy output in milk uh, per unit metabolic body weight, they're absolutely the same. So the, the, the biological processes of synthesizing milk from they're conserved nutrients, yeah. it's, it's the same. And I said that to Paul Moe once, and he said, well, why should they be different? The, the relationship's the same in, in sheep and in goats. You know, it's just how, cow, how milk is synthesized. Um, but what has changed, as you say, is we've selected animals for certain traits. And with that has, has brought along different requirements. Uh, our, when we were doing that lactating beef study, um, uh, we were feeding ad libitum and we quickly had to stop because they didn't go into negative energy balance because they were only producing three kilos of milk a day. You know? and, and I think your analogy is a very good one. Uh, the difference in maintenance energy requirements is probably related to gut mass and, and the level of intake of those animals and how that affects the intercept of the regression. It's really more a mathematical calculation of maintenance requirement. And, th and that's what's happening. But so, so David, yes, I, I, I think you're right. Evolutionarily, uh, what we're feeding today is probably different than, than what evolved for, for many, many years before we started selectively breeding cows for very high levels of milk yield and having to manage them by feeding them something other than just grazed grass. Next question. Hi, Anna Sutcliffe from KW AB Agri. Thank you very much for your presentations this morning. Uh, they're absolutely fascinating. We focused quite a lot on the benefits to the transition cow, but, and um, Dr. Santos, you explained some of the metabolic fates of, of the protected choline, uh, but we haven't touched on the benefits for the in utero calf. And I'd be fascinated to know your opinion of how the calf could be benefiting from supplemental choline. Please. <laughs> yeah, so there's been, there, there have been some experiments that uh, evaluate that because we're feeding during those last, last uh, three to four weeks of gestation. So our assumption is that there is transfer of uh, choline metabolites through the placenta to the calf or as constituents of placental tissue. And obviously there is uh, the possibility of enriching colostrum with choline metabolites. Yeah. So the very first experiment that we've done with my colleague Charles Staples in Florida, uh, we looked at colostrum uh, yield, and I think you guys saw some of the work that uh, was cited today uh, earlier on that there was uh, an increase in uh, IgG output because there was an increase in yield of uh, uh, colostrum and IgG associated with that. So that was some indication that we can change what the calf gets from the cows. And that was replicated in a, another experiment and then there was the work done at Michigan State University and then uh, uh, UW-Madison uh, that they've always shown uh, that. And then obviously we were interested in the calf. So in one of our experiments, we had uh, four treatments uh, for the calves. We had what we call choline exposure in utero, when the dam received choline. And then uh, we had calves that were born from dams that were fed no supplemental room protected choline. Then when they were born, uh, we had a factorial arrangement in which Half of the calves born from uh, dams that received supplemental choline received their own treatment as a colostrum feeding. So we tubed the calves and fed them uh, 3.8 liters of colostrum. Or they were fed colostrum from the uh, opposite treatment. So we had the four permutations uh, posed uh, natally. And in that particular experiment, it was a proof of concept. We challenged the male calves with a, a sepsis model. We gave them lipopolysaccharide intravenously, which is not, I have to be honest, not a great model to mimic spontaneous disease. It's like, I'm going to give you an atomic bomb and see if you survive or not. Okay? But it's a proof of concept. 
because our premise was that uh, choline would enrich phosphatidylcholine pools, and there are many phosphatidylcholines, and they have anti-inflammatory properties, perhaps can help the calf withstand uh, a bacterial challenge. And in, indeed, that's exactly what happened. Uh, the worst treatment, the ones that we kill calves, was the one that they were born from dams that were not supplemented choline, and they were fed colostrum from dams that did not receive choline. Okay? So that was the initial indication to us, at least in the calf model, because there's data with other species that there is potentially prenatal transfer or enrichment of poles, and there is potentially postnatal transfer through colostrum, and that provides some degree of protection of the calf uh, to uh, uh, pro-inflammatory response. Now, we fed a standard amount of, of colostrum to those calves, so in terms of other nutrients, we, and we haven't quantified everything in colostrum, because colostrum has lots of active peptides, hormones that we haven't measured. We just measure total protein, IgG, fat, uh, solids, not fat. Uh, in colostrum, and the amount of IgG they got was not really different between the treatments. So we attribute those differences to choline effect, but it may be that we changed something else in colostrum that we didn't quantify, and, and that explains some of those responses. So then subsequently, uh, University of Wisconsin Madison uh, did a, conducted a similar experiment. I, I won't remember all the details. Clay can probably clarify some of the details. <clears throat> but they look at newborn calves that were crossbred. In the U.S., there's a lot of uh, beef semen being used on farms. So the crossbred calves were used to uh, follow them during postnatal relative to their development all the way to the feedlot phase and look at body composition. And they did show some postnatal changes in those calves in terms of body composition, more favorable body composition, feed efficiency. So there's some hints there that there are positive effects on calves. We've completed a very large experiment with 2,000 cows with 21 replicated pens on a commercial farm. We don't have it published yet, so I'm a little, uh, skeptical of telling you too much because we don't have it all worked out. So we enrolled 2,000 cows, uh, about 1,000 baby heifers were born. The students lived on the farm. We fed the pen, not the cow, so we had 21 experimental units, but with many cows per, per pen. So we had uh, uh, 11 treated pens and 10 control pens. Okay, uh, prepartum. We fed prepartum to cows last three weeks prepartum. And then we follow those baby heifers postpartum. We look at colostrum yield and composition from all those 2,000 cows. And then the students had to feed either colostrum from the same treatment or from the opposite treatment to the baby calves. So postnatal, we had what we call a split plot design. We had the prenatal treatment that we have 11 experimental units, and then we have the postnatal treatment that we have 1,000 experimental units, because now we treat the calves individually. And we had some minor benefits to calves uh, in, in that experiment. So uh, there are some information out there that uh, it will benefit calves. I don't think we understand that very well. We are in this stage of everything is imprinting and it's epigenetic changes, which I find it too easy to explain. We say that something is going to change the DNA of the animal and alter gene expression. It's very possible because choline through betaine is a methyl donor, and that can alter how genes are expressed, and maybe silencing or enhancing expression can benefit the animal. But I, I think we have a, still a poor understanding of the effects that I could make a major claim here. I think it goes in the positive direction. It's another plus to supplementing choline. I just don't know if we know exactly what to expect. Well, well said. So, yeah. 
the University of Wisconsin work with the with the the crossbred calves, the, the beef on dairy. Um, at at slaughter, they actually saw a different an improvement in marbling score, yeah. and the in those uh, those cross calves that that were born to the reassure supplemented dams. So, it would be another positive point to be considered yeah. as an important component of this nutrient. Yes. Jose, can I yes. ask you a question? Sure. Yeah. Actually, I have one for you. <laughs> I just want to let guys, everybody yeah. ask questions. Sorry, apologies. But uh, the, on the subject of colostrum, so the choline effect on colostrum production, colostrum yield, is that, uh, do you know the biology of that in terms of the mechanism, <laughs> or is it just similar to the effect on milk yield generally? Yeah, so if you ask me, I don't know the mechanism, to be 100% honest. It is but, fascinating. Yeah, we yeah. really don't know. It's a, a replicated response that I, I'm always afraid when we run an experiment and we find something that we didn't think about it, we, we measure because we, we better measure this. And I'm always afraid, is this, can this be replicated? So I was very happy that when we did two experiments, we replicated. And then when other people, so it's not just a phenomenon of the University of Florida, right. uh, replicated. So, so that gives me confidence that there is some biology behind that. If you were to ask me what is the potential mechanism, I would say it has to be related to proliferation of mammary epithelial cells. That would be my take because it's just too quick. I don't think it's disease related because there hasn't been time for disease to affect production at that point. Uh, and I don't think it's by random chance that we allocated better cows to one treatment than the other because after we have three experiments with 300 plus cows, I think by random chance they are equally in terms of their potential for colostrum synthesis. Because one thing that's interesting, genomic markers for improved milk yield have no relationship to what improves colostrum yield, which is kind of odd. Yeah? And I always thought that if I select cows for more milk, they should give more colostrum, but it's not necessarily a direct relationship. So uh, my take is that probably choline is affecting proliferation or maybe apoptosis of memory cells at that uh, late gestation period. Uh, how does that happen? I, we really don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you. Jose, you have a question for Chris now. I do, but there was one. Oh, there, you so have I'm a question back a there. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, Richard Hopwood, Agricultural Central Trading. Uh, Jose, you spoke this morning um, with confidence in your meta-analysis to give a positive picture of choline. Um, and of that, you sort of mentioned that 1,313 cows were second lactation would you or, or older would you be able to give us any sort of guidance whether choline has a positive effect the older the cow is or mm -hmm. please if you could just sort of give us some clues on that one what you found i don't have an answer for you so and i'll tell you why uh well first because i don't know but the data do not allow us to partition those responses. And it's because we did not receive the raw data. We use, I went to the literature and I found uh, after a very extensive literature review, all the papers that were randomized control experiments in which choline was fed as a room protected product orally, not in the properly identified experimental unit. So that's, that was the initial premise of our uh, literature search. The issue is that when somebody publishes a paper like me, we don't sort second from third from fourth lactation. We don't report that separately. We basically put it all together as multi pairs. So there is no way for me to go back to the data and try to tease out is the response different between a third lactation versus the second lactation. I, we really don't have those data from the published literature. If I go to individual Investigators, yeah, they, I'm sure they can provide the responses according to lactation number. So that's one thing. 
What I can tell you is that we still have a scarcity of data with first lactation animals. I think that's the major, well, I mean, uh, it's one of the major weaknesses in the literature today is that we have these two beasts that are same species, the same breed, but there are certain things they don't behave exactly the same. A heifer is still growing, a cow is not growing as much anymore, the body composition changes. So there are certain things that the response between parities is not always the same, sometimes can be exacerbated. And a good example would be protein in heifers, you know, from Dr. Reynolds' work. So I think we, we don't know, I can tell you that we don't know very much about heifers in that aspect, but I cannot give you an answer between a second, a third, a third, and a fourth. So. Now, Jose, you did just publish a paper recently with, with nulliparous animals. Yeah, we did. So, but here's uh, my own, cri the criticism to my own data. We published a paper in which we did a, a on-farm experiments with multiple pens. In that particular experiment, <clears throat> in one of the farms, we were lucky enough that they had, uh, through replication, we had 10 prepartum pens. So five control, five room protected choline. And we enrolled 583 heifers, if I'm not mistaken. The issue is that we only fed prepartum and they were all nulliparous. So we cannot sort out whether, we still had a response in milk. It was not as much as other experiments. It was about 0.8 kilograms. Uh, it was statistically significant. There were changes in plasma choline in blood right at calving. We didn't feed prospartum. So I don't know if the smaller response relative to what the body of literature shows is because we use heifers or because we fed only prepartum or a combination of both. Our experiment does not allow us to separate that. So. Uh, Colin Hamilton, Independent Feeds. Firstly, I hope I, I can articulate my question, but it revolves around two statements. One was that intestinal length going up by five meters for a cow in early lactation, and a statement about the architecture of the intestine. Hmm. Now that just thought a bit of a tangential question here, but uh, if we have suboptimal utilization or absorption of nutrients to the cow, I would suggest by definition it comes out the back end. Now I'm involved practically working with cows normally fed at the front end, but do we have a situation where we chase the wrong problem when cows are perhaps scouring and are loose? And could it be a nutrient deficiency problem as opposed to something like acidosis, dietary sorting, etc.? Should we analyze not just the forage that goes in the cow, but should we analyze the muck that comes out the back end of the cow? And I do apologize for that question, but it just tickled my thought about intestinal <laughs> architecture. Um, thank you, Jose. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good question. And I think obviously, you know, um, anybody going onto a farm is going to look at muck as an indicator of, of the diet quality. And there is a lot we can learn. We were involved in a, um, a CEREC funded project looking at various uh, precision technologies that we might be able to use to analyze feces uh, as an indicator of the quality of the diet. Uh, and we were looking at uh, infrared analysis, we were looking at uh, artificial intelligence for using pictures to try to get at particle size, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think there is a lot we can learn by, analyze, by, by uh, evaluating fecal uh, composition, not just consistency, uh, but composition as well. So just some, some thoughts from me. I mean, there, there, there are people that have used NIR uh, analysis of feces to predict intake, for example. Uh, on, on, and, and, you know, it's used quite a lot in studying wild ruminants, uh, fecal analysis to predict forage quality, forage intake, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think there is a lot of potential there. And it's a very good question. So if I understood your question, you're concerned with the fact that 
there is this dynamic changes in the intestine in early lactation because of the changes in intake and the uptake of nutrients. Uh, at the same time that uh, maybe absorption can be altered because we in create some insults in the gastrointestinal tract. I think it's a very valid point. In the US today, there's a line of research by uh, a very bright colleague, uh, Lance Baumgart, who thinks that uh, <clears throat> there is disruption in uh, intestinal architecture uh, because of changes in patterns of feed intake. Uh, not necessarily because the cow eats less, I think, uh, and I don't want to misinterpret his conclusions, but uh, <clears throat> I think it's related to uh, the behavior of the animal. Uh, for instance, I, my analogy is if tomorrow I decide to go on a diet and I simply skip lunch and dinner and then I eat something, I don't think I'm going to have a digestive problem. It's a voluntary decision I make. But if I came here today and you guys were having a meal and Clay didn't allow me to go to the feed bunk, I probably would feel anxious and say, hey, come on, Clay, let me eat some. And maybe that would cause some uh, changes in my gastrointestinal tract. And I think that's his take on sometimes we create issues on farms that cows are unable to eat what they want. And that creates uh, issues in terms of the so-called uh, leaky gut, yeah? So the tight junctions become weaker and then things leak in and leak out of the intestine. So I think that's a possibility. Uh, and with, associated with that, we just heard, you know, the gastrointestinal tract changes in terms of size and that requires nutrients to build the additional tissue. Yeah? Uh, so you're building cell membrane, you're adding protein, you know, you're consuming a mental fat and you're moving it somewhere else. So that, uh, and, and I think for most of you who spend a lot of time on farms, you'll see that when do we have most bouts of diarrhea? It's usually in fresh cows because there's other associated effects such as postpartum fever, uh, endotoxins coming from the uterus because of metritis and an increased risk of mastitis. So all of those things combine obviously disrupt how the cow eats and probably has systemic effects in the gastrointestinal tract. Having said that, there is uh, <clears throat> recent data which replicates a lot of previous experiment because of this concept that uh, <clears throat> uh, what causes these changes is the diet that we are feeding, that maybe we are moving too much starch to the intestine and that alters and causes what they call hindgut acidosis. I personally am from the school that if you damage the rumen, the small intestine, large intestine is a consequence to what you did to the rumen. The hemodynamic changes that affect the animal and that's why eventually you show up with loose feces, mucus in the feces, etc. But in these experiments, uh, <coughs> at Iowa State, they, if I'm not mistaken, they infuse as much as three kilograms of hydrolyzed starch in the intestine and nothing happened to the cows. They were as healthy, according to them, as... So I think it's, you know, the combination of cow wanting to eat and not being able to associate with postpartum disease and the toxins that are coming from the uterus and perhaps the mammary gland, uh, plus uh, insults to the room, and I would say, if I had to bet money, that were where I would put my money. Can I add? Some of this work on leaky gut has also identified heat stress as oh, a trigger, yeah. which is how the work at Iowa State sort of, that's where that started, was looking at heat stress. And it could be th through similar mechanisms, but, or there could be a specific effect of heat stress. And that's been shown, uh, some of Frank Dunshay's work in pigs has shown that right. quite clearly. Yep. Hi, Anna Sutcliffe again. Um, one for you, Chris. I'm really fascinated by your, your work on protein supplementation in those early transition days. Um, do you think fundamentally we are underestimating 
metabolizable protein requirements in that very early phase cow um, as she goes into her lactation? Or is it just the fact that we're not managing that transition particularly well? And if so, do we need to put sort of safety factors in with regarding her protein, um, pro protein nutrition? Well, that's a good question. I mean, just, you know, and I think simplistically, because I'm simple, um, I think my interpretation is that the cow has the genetic potential to produce more milk and yield more and but she's not able to in those early the, those early days of lactation because she she's not eating enough she's not receiving enough metabolizable protein as a, as a and she is in negative balance if that makes sense so you know if you if you base her requirement on what she's producing then you'd probably say okay she's producing you know she's meeting her requirement you know this is you know this is the chicken and egg we get into in terms of require you know predicting requirements um so i think we need to say okay what is she genetically able to achieve and making try to provide enough metabolizable protein to allow her to achieve that now whether the requirements might be slightly different at that stage in lactation i need to think about that but i would say probably not drastically different so, Good question. So, Chris, can you can you comment on you know these early lactation studies? So we see these big milk and energy corrective milk responses, but no increasing dry matter intake. Yes, I mean this was Clay. It's a really good question, and it's it's I, 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 in my presentation I had left some slides where I have this whole list of questions that, are, that we, we'd like to answer, and one of my concerns is with this approach. Um, is what potentially could we be doing to energy balance of the cows if their intakes don't increase? And I went back and looked at the old Orskoff data, <laughs> yeah. uh, feeding oh. fish meal to cows. Uh, that were, by yeah, tish, yeah. yeah they, they, were, they were fed grass silage ad libitum and supplemented with fish meal. And he had to stop the study because they all got ketosis oh. uh, because they were producing so much milk and losing so much uh, body fat. Uh, that it became excessive. And, and one of our concerns was that potentially we could uh, cause cows to milk off their backs, you know, uh, so to speak, by doing that. And if you look at Moen's data, um, there's not a huge, I think, uh, increase in NIFAs in blood and things like that as an indicator of excessive body fat mobilization. But I think it is a concern and something we need to think about. If we're able to achieve those, those kind of increases, um, I think, you know, uh, it'd be interesting to look at the, the most recent study that was done as part of the uh, Smart Cow Transnational Access Program that was done at, at Denmark, where they didn't see as much of a milk yield response with just the essentials um, uh, as they did with the total amino acids in casein, so the non-essentials being there. Perhaps we're providing more energy. It'd be, it'd be interesting to look at, at you know, the non-esterified fatty acid concentrations as indicators of mobilization. But yeah, my worry was when I saw the results was, you know, this could be a Bob Orskoff type response, you know, to, like, like he got with the fish meal. Can I just uh, piggyback on this? So if the, the Danish work, what would be your it's two questions. What would be your interpretation? Where is the cow getting the additional glucose? Because, uh, you know, they, she can easily mobilize body tissue to make up for the long chain fatty acids there. But where is she getting the additional glucose given that, you know, you think that, hey, this uh, amino acids are not being extensively used for gluconeogenesis. Mm -hmm. Is she changing how she uses uh, propionate and maybe glycerol? to make up for that additional glucose and the extra four, five, six kilos mm. of milk. So the extra 200 grams of 300 grams of glucose that she needs to make up that. That's the first question. And then I want to move now to the ap <laughs> applied side. How much crude protein and concentration of metabolized protein should I aim, aim for my fresh pen based on 
what you've looked at. To answer your second question, I'm, it may depend on how much, how much dry matter, how much feed we can get the cow to eat. Because that may be, you know, in terms of getting that supplement into the cow, it may determine how much milk she's able to produce. I think the, the data suggests she's, she's able to produce more than she's achieving because, we're, because she's not getting that protein in very early lactation and she's in deficit. Your second question is a really good one, especially, oh, sorry, your first question, especially based on what I was saying about the amino acid requirements yeah. uh, for glucose production. And she may be changing how she's using glucose in other tissues, uh, maybe more core recycling, I don't know. But it's intriguing that in that third study that was done at, at, at Folum, that when they compared the essentials only to the totals that the included total was the non the they got much more milk yeah. with the totals. Yeah. And maybe some of that was non-essentials being used for glucose. I don't know. But all the work I'm talk, I, I, I showed, um, the, the, you know, we were working with a set amount of milk yield, if you know what I mean. And so the cows were metabolizing their liver. Their, I always think about liver metabolism in early lactation being determined by milk yield and milk, milk uh, the requirements for milk production that are occurring uh, and the changes that are occurring in the gut sort of driven by the intake of the cows and the diet that she's fed. The liver metabolism is, is being determined by pr the, productive res uh, the production of the cow and the productive response. Because the in theory in those experiments, other than amino acids being used as, uh, uh, some of them using as gluconeogenic precursors, the supply substrate for gluconeogens didn't really change because intake remained the same. That's eh? right, that's right. So and somehow it, they, they change how they use glucose. In two of those studies, intake didn't change. In one of them, it actually went down slightly. The, the, the one that uh, was done at Linuxville with total amino acids, is free amino acids, your intake actually went down slightly in spite of that increase in milk yield. So. so now I, I go to the, to, back to my farm and I have a fresh pen. The cows spend two to three weeks there. What should I target? And particularly here in Europe that you guys cannot use animal based proteins. Like we can still use blood meal and things like that. Yeah, in the rest. yeah. I, I, think, I think there's potential there. And that's, that's where the work that I showed, uh, that, again, that, that was done at Folum in Denmark, they were trying to, uh, you know, use that, what they'd learned and see if they could apply it by providing this four kilos of the Easy Boost compound. And they got hints for a, a, of an effect, but they had a lot of cows that didn't, didn't, didn't want to eat it. So having a, a source of metabolizable protein um, that, that the cows will consume quickly after calving. But it's gonna, that could, that could, it, maybe it's because you have to do your treatments in the parlor to feed them individually, but maybe incorporating the TMR, there would be less refusal, eh? Right. Potentially. And, and you want to have, you know, any, as, as you know, a cow has a difficult calving. She's not going to want to yeah. eat right yeah. away. So it, it, it's good management during calving. Would be, would, it, it, that's going to really help that problem of inappetence after calving. Yeah. I'll make a comment that has nothing to do with dairy cows, it has to do with uh, uh, beef cattle. Uh, and he used the exact same technique that Dr. Reynolds used to look at pose absorption. So there's a, a beautiful experiment that was done by uh, investigators at Oklahoma State University in which they induce uh, inflammatory disease in the lungs because they were interested in pneumonia and shipping fever. And I like to make the analogy of pneumonia. We don't have a lot of pneumonia in dairy cows, thank God. Uh, but we have plenty of metritis in dairy cows. And they have some of the phenotypes similar. Acute phase response, reduced appetite, different tissues that are affected. But metritis has a lot of toxin that gets dumped into the bloodstream. Probably more so than pneumonia does, although pneumonia destroys the lungs. But in that particular experiment, they had multi-catheterized beef steers, about 400 kilogram animals. It was Clint Cribble uh, who did the work. Uh, and they uh, 
infuse those animals. They had four treatments. I'm going to just tell you about the main effects of inducing inflammation or not inducing inflammation. So they infuse either sterile saline in the lungs of the steers, or they infuse uh, Mannheim hemolytica, the old pastoral hemolytica that causes pneumonia. So uh, then they measure lots of things across the splunknic bed, uh, and they then eventually measure across the liver what's coming from the portal drain viscera and leaving through the uh, hepatic vein. And what they showed in that particular experiment was that uh, when you induce inflammation, the extraction of essential amino acids by the liver goes up. So the net flux becomes more negative because it's negative in the control would be more negative in the, the uh, treated animals. But then when they look at non-essential amino acids, the net flux was positive in the control, the animals that received saline, but it actually became negative. So the liver was consuming non-essential amino acids and they measure acute phase protein. So the interpretation was that the liver was uh, either using amino acids to synthesize other proteins, uh, uh, such as fibrinogen, seroplasmin, uh, you know, uh, haptoglobin, whatever, to combat the infection inflammation, and maybe using as an energy source as well. And then when you do a little bit of math, when you look at the net flux differential between the control and the, uh, uh, the saline versus the inflammation, and I put that in the perspective of a cow that has disease and doesn't. Maybe it's not exactly the same, but I like to think that there's a lot of resemblance. And you calculate based on the millimoles per hour, and then you go there, get the molecular weight, the amino acids. Uh, there's about a 2.6 moles of amino acids post-liver differential, which is huge. Uh, so, trying to remember, it's like... Uh, it was almost 400 grams of amino acids. And this is post-liver, so you already pay the taxes at the mesenteric drain viscera, at the portal drain viscera, and the liver, because all of those tissues take up some of your metabolized protein that you feed, yeah? The metabolized protein is basically what you expect the intestine to digest. But then at every step of absorption, the liver is taking some of that, or the intestine is taking some. So this is at what's after the post liver, and that's the equivalent protein. If you look at the efficiency of protein extraction by the mammary gland of those amino acids, it's the equivalent of the protein content in eight kilograms of milk. So there is a big pay if your cow gets sick in terms of amino acid use. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there is an experiment at UW Madison that they supplement methionine to transition cows. And they had your typical response. It was a big experiment. It was on-farm experiment. But they locked cows up every day, and they top dress in front of the cows. So they could use the cow as the experimental unit. So cows came back from the parlor in a big commercial dairy. They locked them up. The grad student went there, put the X grams in front of the cow, pushed the feed down, and went through the pen, the control and the treat, control and the treat. And what they showed was your typical milk protein response. But all the response came from the cows that had disease. Yeah, all the, the milk response and milk protein response came from, if a cow had morbidity, which 30-some percent of the postpartum cows had, that's where they increased milk protein uh, substantially. So my interpretation is that those cows don't eat very much. You give a little more. Some of that is used for uh, uh, other functions than just synthesizing milk protein. And then you get a big response, so indicating that this transition period is more complicated than we think, I guess. Other questions for the panel? Uh, Martin McConnell, uh, Trident Micronutri. Thanks for your presentations this, this morning. Um, I have two questions. Um, First one, I suppose, in terms of amino acid supply to cows at grass, have you any recommendations there? And is there anything new coming down the tracks in that regard? And uh, Dr. Santos mentioned earlier about energy supply and amino acid supply. 
are there any specific recommendations in that regard in terms of maybe synchrony uh, equations and so on in terms of energy and amino acid supply? Uh, thank you for the question. In terms of the one on f cows on grass, um, I think, you know, the challenge there is obviously uh, a lot of that protein is room degradable protein. So in terms of, uh, you know, uh, I think the, the MP systems apply equally to, 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 to that system, uh, but there is a, a high amount of rumen degradable protein. So there, there's some real challenges there. Uh, in terms of anything new coming down the pike, uh, I'd be looking to members of this audience and asking them that question. Uh, so um, nothing that, that, that I'm working on personally, okay? Uh, and Jose, I think in terms of the energy to, to amino and, and ratios between energy and amino acids. Yeah, so I would not necessarily think about synchrony from the concept of synchrony in the rumen. You know, this concept that sounds good in the paper, but very difficult to replicate in terms of degradation of protein, degradation of carbohydrates or, or fermentable organic matter. But there's been a somewhat of a movement, uh, at least by the Cornell group, to come up with recommendations of metabolizable amino acids, at least uh, methionine, lysine, histidine, uh, uh, in terms of grams of metabolizable amino acids per megacal of metabolizable energy. I think where it gets complicated is how you calculate those things because different models have different assumptions. The Cornell model, they use their own assumptions, uh, whatever Mike Van Amberg is working on and the predictions of supply of metabolizable energy and metabolizable methionine, lysine, histidine. Obviously, if you use the NASIM, it will probably be a different prediction. Then you have to readjust those guidelines. And if you use your own softwares that doesn't use any of those platforms, it would be probably slightly different because the supply of microbial amino acids would differ, but they have specific guidelines that they are working on. I'm not sure if it's all set. I don't remember all the values, but it's something, and Clay would probably remember, something like 1.10 or 1.12 grams of methionine for every megacal of metabolizable energy. Histidine is somewhat similar to methionine, and then lysine is about 2.8 times that amount uh, so if you go to some of the literature, uh, the Florida Nutrition Conference has those guidelines, the Cornell Nutrition Conference, you can get, you can go in our website at the Florida Nutrition Conference, you can download our proceedings, you're going to see that there. Uh, but yeah, they are creating these specific values based on estimates. I think this needs to be then validated through experimentation. We manipulate and see what's the optimum response. But I think there's merit to it, and we very likely we will move that direction. I would guess. So clear. Yeah. So, so the so the recommendations, and they are very model specific, as Jose said. But for the if it's CNCPS biology, the latest recommendation, if you want to maximize energy corrected milk yield, for lysine, it's 3.2 grams metabolizable lysine per megacal of ME. It was 3.0, 3.1 before that, but the new recommendation is 3.2. Methionine is now 1.19 grams metabolizable methionine per megacal of ME. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, the numbers you were saying is what it was previously. And it, it, yeah, the histidine requirement we think is very close to the methionine requirement. Yeah. And for, for you guys, probably histidine would be quite important, yeah, because you don't have blood meal and maybe you rely very heavily on grass silages and microbial protein is not ideal in terms of histidine. I'm, so that might be an important amino acid for you, more so than for us. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to ask Balkem to make histidine. 
protected. We've made a lot experimentally. It works great experimentally. It's just but that uh, you can put in the market <laughs> exactly That's right. Yes. A question for um, Chris Reynolds, please. Um, have you a an opinion on feeding? When to feed amino acids? Is it detrimental to the uh, performance of the cow to feed them post calving? Given it a lag of 40 days, or are you better off feeding it immediately post calving? Oh, I think the data I was showing was feeding them within, providing them within hours of calving. So I think I think the cow is able to respond to the supplemental metabolizable protein, including the essential amino acids in that metabolizable protein, um, as soon as possible after calving. So, so I would. I would, and, and there's good evidence of, of a sustained benefit in terms of production that carries over after stopping the supplementation. Be my so, interpretation. So the earlier in lactation you can supplement, but the likelihood of getting milk responses is much higher. And, and the cow, as I showed from, with Moen's data, uh, Moen Larson's data, and, and some of the subsequent work they've done, the cow can respond immediately within day, with, with, you know, within hours of providing that. Uh, this is using an abomasal infusion technique, so, um, and we used a room and drench in our studies. And the, the, the response that was achieved in those very controlled situations was immediate right. and large. Nine kilograms a day increase in milk yield. Yeah, I've, I've done it uh, historically going back six years ago. And initially, my very first um, trial or, or my very first time that I actually balanced amino acids, I got a 0.3% increase in butter fat and protein. And um, Phil Gordoso was my man, so I was getting all the information from Phil. Post 120 days, stopped feeding it, and the two liters kept going, and so did the improvement in milk protein and fats. But um, it doesn't always work on every farm, and I, there seems no, I can't identify the reason. Um, possibly following on from that is a question. If you're short of energy, do you try and make it up with carbohydrates or ketogenic fat? And does, does either work? Um, in terms of the yield response? Yeah. And it, it, if the metabolizable protein is sufficient to meet the target increase in yield, then um, it, I would think that the response, you could get a response with either carbohydrate or fat. But I, mm -hmm. I would have to, you know, it would depend on the diets that you're, you're working with. So. Thank you. Julia Morehouse from Mapabag. A question for Chris on the experiment with regard to the four kilos of soy pass um, maize gluten. Did you measure the individual dry matter, total dry matter intakes for those animals? And if so, did, was that four kilos on top of their baseline ration or did they substitute some intake of baseline ration in order to eat the four kilos? And how much of the impact could have been due to uh, increase in total dry matter intake? Um. It's not my study, it's a colleague's study, and I was working from an abstract at EAAP. Those were total dry matter intakes on an individual cow basis. So um, uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure I could answer that in terms of how much of the supplement substituted for the ration, which you would expect there might be some substitution, absolutely. No. It's a very good question. Well, with that, I've heard last call. <clears throat> so um, it's been a great conversation here at the Real Science Exchange. And um, let's take a step back and um, we'll go around the table here. And um, I'm going to ask each of, each of you to give one take home point for the audience. 
Our last call question is sponsored by AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine, the next generation in amino acid balancing. With AminoSure XM, you can save up to $0.05 cents per cow per day on your methionine investment. Try it today and receive an additional $0.2.5 cents per cow per day savings with Belchem's limited-time rebate offer. Contact your Belchem representative to learn more. I'll just make a side comment. Scott Sorrell was supposed to be here. We wish him a fast and speedy recovery. So he's typically our host, correct? Yes, yes, thanks, Jose. Uh, I would say consider choline as a required nutrient. That would be my very short message. It fits probably better than some nutrients that we actually feed. I'll give an example, vitamin D. Choline would actually fit uh, more properly as a required nutrient than supplementing cholecalciferol to dairy cows, particularly if they have some exposure to sunshine. That would be my short message. Chris? Clay, thank you, and thank you for hosting us today. Um, I guess my, I'd go back to what we were just saying, that I think many of our cows, most of our cows, have the genetic potential produce, to produce a lot more milk than they are achieving in very early lactation, in the, in the early days of lactation. And I think we need to look at that in terms of how we might be able to help them achieve that potential yield. Yep. Thank you. And then a comment about my presentation. Um, as the title said, not, not all NCAPs are created equally. Um, my, my comment to people would be make sure that, um, make sure that you're, you're, you're able to see published in vivo research with these products done by, by reputable institutions to, to prove that these products are really working in the animals. So with that, I want to thank everyone for sharing your knowledge, your time, and, your com and the conversation today. To our loyal listeners, thanks for coming along for each episode and sticking with us as we explore more topics. We hope, we hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. Thank you. Love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.